the class is the memory of Jared Orchem, and we today we're going to learn again the Talmud and the Parsha of the week. The Parsha of the week is Chayei Sarah. Chayei Sarah, there is a line there, right before the old story of Abraham sending Eliezer to find a shidduch for his son Isaac. It's written, and Abraham is old, advanced in his ears, and Hashem blessed Abraham in all things. Hashem berach et Avraham bakol. Remember the word, bakol. In everything. Then the Talmud goes into a discussion, and the Torah says God blessed Abraham in everything. What is, how, how far is this God? How, the, how far is the everything? What is the everything? That one commentary says it's not in this page, that God gave him a blessing, and gave him a goal. He had a goal, a daughter too. Some people say that at that time, because Abraham couldn't find for a shidduch, that the blessing was that he didn't have a daughter. Now, at, here at the Talmud says here something very interesting about Abraham. What means Bako? The first line on the top of the page. God blessed Abraham with what? A precious? I'm still looking. First line. A precious stone hung from the neck of Abraham, our forefather. And any sick person that looked at it was instantly cured. You hear? What does this mean? You had like a stone here, you looked at it, you cured? No, it's more than that. Anybody who saw Abraham, who came to see Abraham, Abraham was a righteous man, a tzaddik. He came there, he was cured. Just by seeing the tzaddik, he was cured. He gave him a broche, the rabbi gave him a broche, he became cured. Anybody who came to see the Rebbe was half killed right by being there. That means to say there is certain people who are holy and there is such radiance and aura around them that just being around them kills you. Then the, the Talmud puts it in a way he had a stone on his neck. It wasn't on his neck. It was him. Him, his whole personality killed anybody around him. And what happened? When Abraham, our forefather, passed from the world, the Holy One, blessed is he, hung the stone in the orb of the sun. Basically, God took the power that Abraham had to cure the world, and he gave it to the sun. What does this mean, he gave it to the sun? The Talmud explains right away. The Gemara interjects. Abayah said, this is borne out uh, by the popular saying, when the sun is lifted, sickness is lifted. Okay. I.e. sunshine I, helps to alleviate sickness. Every sick person experienced that when, when at night the sickness is out there, it's heavier, you're more sick. The uh, dawn breaks and you start to feel a little better. During the day, a sick person feel, uh, feels better. Why? Because the sun brings cure to the world. Shemesh Marpe, the sun brings a cure to the world. Then the Talmud says, before the sun brought the cure, Abraham used to bring, or while the sun was doing, Abraham used to bring, it was like this. When, when, a, when a person was around Abraham, he felt better. You know, next to certain people, you feel better. You know, sometimes you go to the doctor and you see the doctor's office, you don't feel any pain. You walk out and you said, I don't know what happened to me. Now all the pain came back. <laughs> some, uh, some, around some people, you start to feel sicker. <laughs> Usually around negative people, you feel even more sick. <laughs> if you're visiting yeah, some uh, people that you're not so fond about, then you say, okay, can you live, can you live, please, I'm sick already. And about, about a, a very holy person, an optimistic person, and happy person, you can feel elevated, that was Aipa. That's what the Talmud says, the meaning was, Bakol, God bless them with everything. That's the everything that he was able to cure other people. That's one explanation. Hello. Okay. The Bryce. The Bryce continues with other versions of the blessing signified by uh, Bacol. Bacol. Another, Another meaning to the word Bacol, that God blessed Abraham with everything, means something more than that. What does this mean? Another interpretation. Abraham was blessed in that his grandson Esau did not rebelled during his lifetime. Okay. Esau, well, Esau and Jacob were born. When Abraham was, how old was Isaac when Esau and Jacob were born? Isaac was 60. 
If Isaac was 60, how old was Abraham? 160. How old was Abraham when he died? 175. Then how old was uh, Jacob and Esau when Abraham died? 15. There's a whole discussion. Really 15. But if you take the, the, the it's not, it doesn't have to be exactly the beginning of 175 and the beginning of the, then the Talmud says he was 13 years old. Basically what he says here is that Esau, until the age of 13, is a child, he's not responsible. Abraham never saw Esau becoming a bad boy. <coughs> then that was the blessing, to see, not to see your children, your grandchildren becoming bad. He died, God took him away before he was able, so to speak, Abraham was supposed to live 180 years old, 180. How we know it's supposed to be 180? Because Isaac lived 180. Why? One of the explanations is why Hashem took Abraham away five years earlier. He shouldn't see his grandchildren, Esau, becoming a real bandit. That, that he says, what's the blessing that he didn't see Esau becoming a bad? I know their interpretation. Abraham was blessed in that his son, uh, Ishmael, repented during his lifetime. Oh, that Ishmael came back home. Ishmael came back to, to the believing of God, basically. Because Ishmael was thrown out of the house. Why was Israel chased out of the house? <coughs> Why Sarah threw him out? Not because mm -hmm. she didn't like him. I because, because Ishmael became a bad influence on, 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 on Isaac. What this was the bad influence? One of the explanations is he was idol worshipping. The whole house of Abraham is about believing in God and somebody inside the house. that uh, Sarah said, I cannot afford the bad influence on my child. Get him out of here. But I thought Ishmael didn't repent until Ab at the funeral for Abraham. By the funeral, we saw that he repented. It doesn't mean he didn't do it before that. You understand? Mm -hmm. We are going to discuss it in a minute. Yeah, Nachmanides has a really interesting commentary on this. He says, you're really saying something bad about Abraham if, if uh, Ishmael becomes an idol worshiper because you know, Abraham is supposed to have the influence on his children. I mean, certainly from chapter 18. And Nachmanides really comes down on that chapter in me, 18. Uh, that, that's where the Sodom and Gomorrah story, or before Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, where I have to t God says, I have to tell Abraham what I'm going to do because he's going to teach his children. But his children, the way we really understand, was it's ultimate his children. <laughs> is, no, it's, all, it's, it's, it's Isaac. Mm -hmm. But Ishmael, Ishmael was, uh, doesn't mean, uh, Ishmael was bad. I mean, I mean, uh, oh, not, not everybody is so successful with his children, <laughs> even Abraham. <laughs> <laughs> it's clearly that Abraham was not successful with Ishmael, Isaac was not successful with, with, with Esau. Mm -hmm. And not always it works. They say that usually the apple doesn't, apple doesn't fall far from the tree. That's in a normal wind. When it comes to a strong wind, <laughs> the apple can fall far, far from the tree. Sometimes it doesn't work exactly the way you want. We all know that. Then you write, it, does it reflect an Abraham? Yeah, it's written that Abraham, that's why Abraham is, a, is, is not considered completely the father of the Jewish people. Why Jacob is the ultimate? Because Abraham had some outsiders. Yes? The Gemara gives the, the sources, source for these two opinions. From where do we know that Esau did not rebel during Abraham's lifetime? For it is written, Esau came in from the field weary, and the Tanah taught in a Barisa. It was on that day that Abraham, our forefather, passed away, and our forefather Jacob made a stew of lentils with which to comfort his father Isaac. We all know the story. Esau came home tired, and he saw in the, in the Jacob was cooking food, right? And he wanted the food. What's going on? Suddenly Jacob is making food or he became the master in the kitchen. What is happening? <laughs> His father, Isaac, was sitting Shiva. And you see, Shiva, you're not allowed to make your own food. Then somebody has to serve you. But Jacob had to make uh, lentils. And eat, that was all on the day that Abraham died. Why, why, okay, why lentils? That the Gemara gets into a whole thing about the lentils. Before proving that Isa rebelled on the day of Abraham passing, the Gemara explained why Jacob chose lentils as an appropriate dish to offer a mourner. Why lentils? You couldn't find something better than lentils. Why did Jacob choose a dish of lentils? In the West, the Israel, they explained in the name of Rabbi 
barmari. Just as lentil has no mouth in its tissue like other leg legumes, so too a mourner has no mouth. What does this mean? He, si he sits in silent. Just like a lentil does not have a, a crack where to start to open it, it's round and doesn't have a beginning and end, so too does not have a mouth. That's how the Talmud puts it. So too a mourner also does not have a mouth. Usually somebody who's a mourner is like, he doesn't want to talk, he has nothing to say, he's broken. That's one explanation. The other explanation is, another explanation, just as a lentil is round, so too mourning goes around in an inescapable cycle, befalling the inhabitants of the world. As, I, as people say about every, after every funeral, that's how it goes. They talk about somebody, if a guy who died in the right age, they said, that's how life is. His grandma is growing, yeah, it was very nice. It's a cycle. That's, what the, the, that's the other explanation why lentils. Go ahead, the Gemora notes. The Gomorrah notes, notes a practical difference between these two explanations. What is the difference between them? The between the explanation, if it's because it doesn't have, because the mono does not have a mouth, or because it's completely uh, round, because, because life is a cycle. Go ahead. The I'm difference sorry. between them is whether it is appropriate to comfort a mourner with eggs. According to the first explanation, eggs are also appropriate for this purpose, for they have no mouth. According to the second explanation, eggs are not appropriate, for they are not round. But if you, yeah, we have the custom actually to serve eggs, right, by, by after a funeral. Then they are, the eggs do not have, a cooked egg does not have a mouth. I mean, even a reg, regular egg, egg, any egg. And, uh, and, and uh, on the other end, it's not round. It's round, but not round completely. Then he said, that would be the difference. The bottom line is we serve rounds more than, uh, eggs more than lentils. He said lentil too, lentils too, but the idea is, I believe both messages, that it doesn't have a mouth and it's, and it's round. It's the significance of the egg is the symbol of new life, or is yeah, it Yeah, I would but, say. Not, no, where is the new life in the egg? Chicken comes yeah, it's, from it's an egg. No, an egg is. It's a cooked egg. <laughs> there is no yes. life there. It's, it's cooked. dead, for sure dead. It it anyway. chicken. <laughs> but it's always served eggs. You see, because of this, because it's round, because it's there's no mouth, because it's rem reminding us morning. So it says I'm not appropriate. <laughs> Who says it's not appropriate? I'm there. Mm -hmm. No, it's a, it, it, it doesn't. Eggs say. are not appropriate, appropriate. for they're not round. If they are, they are not round, but they have no, don't have a mouth. For the same reason, we put on the Seder plate, we put an egg to remember the destruction of the temple. Because egg is a sign of mourners. And we want to, you need to have on the Seder plate two types of cooked food. That we have the shank bone on one side to remember, we're remembering two sacrifices. Why we shank, shank bone, it makes sense because it's like a sacrifice. Why an egg? Because on one end it's cooked, on the other end it reminds us morning. We mourn the destruction of the temple by putting the egg on the on the on the seder plate. And to survive, we break the fast with the egg. We no, we start before the before the fast. We eat egg before the fast. We don't break the fast with egg. Don't we eat it with the? No, before the fast, not after. After the fast, we don't mourn. The Gemara now, uh, Mr. Jaffe, what do you want? The Gemara now proves that Esau rebelled on the day of Abraham's passing. Reb Yochanan said that scoundrel Esau committed five sins. Scoundrel? On the day what a scoundrel! Bad, bad, bad. bad person. Bad guy. Um, mm -hmm. Scoundrel. <laughs> it's a negative connotation. Okay. He had relations with a betrothed maiden. He murdered someone. He denied the fundamental belief, the existence of God. He denied the doctrine of the resurrection of the dead, and he belittled the birthright. You know, Esau, in the Bible, doesn't sound such a bad guy. <laughs> <laughs> he cared for his parents. Jacob sneaked, him out, sneaked around him, right? He, Jacob got, him, got the, the, the birthright first time, that is. In the Bible, Esau gets pretty good press. In the Talmud, he gets terrible press. <laughs> <laughs> Esau is a bad guy no matter what. 
any bad thing they put on him. He raped a woman, he killed somebody. <laughs> he did everything in one day. What a productive day. <laughs> he it didn't say he had a worship. Wow. Anyway, he did. Yeah, he did. A fundamental belief. Yeah. yeah. Now, they probably had a tradition that, that what they, that's what, how he so behaved. And as many times, the job of the Talmudic rabbis is to find where in the Bible there is a hint to what they know from tradition. You understand what I'm saying? They have a law, they know you have to do this mitzvah. Where is it written in the Bible? They look in the Bible to find, they put the links together. Also this, the proofs on the Bible are not so strong. You wouldn't come up with them on your own. But they had a tradition, they had a, they had a tradition that they did that. They're only finding in the Bible the links to put it together, to kind of proving it that it's written somewhere. The scriptural source for, for these five things. Can I ask okay. you a question? Yeah, you can ask me a question. Because, I, you know, when Moses brought the first tablets down, he broke them, mm -hmm. and then the second mm -hmm. tablets, mm -hmm. it was better because it had mm -hmm. oral Torah mm -hmm. and written mm -hmm. Torah. Mm -hmm. So all this stuff is all considered the uh, oral Torah, everything? Mm -hmm. Yes, sure. This is the Talmud. Sure, sure. So if that's the case, then this, this should, this should uh, hold water, because it's from God. Sure. So, it's you, you say you're making connections. They're they're coming up with connections. They're coming up. That's the that's the old tradition. The old tradition is to put together the the tradition and will to find it in the Bible. The rabbi's job was there were 613 mitzvahs, but many times he didn't know where in the Bible are the mitzvahs written. Where to find it in the Bible? Their job was to put the picture together. Yes. And your question is much more complicated than this, and it's not a contradiction to anything, but move on. I already <laughs> forgot what I asked. <laughs> it's even better. Go ahead. The scriptural the, the source. scriptural sources. <laughs> we know that he had relations with a betrothed maiden, for here it is written, and Asa came in from the field. And elsewhere, in reference to the violation of a betrothed maiden, it is written, for he found her in the field. Oh. It's written when the Torah, <laughs> when the Torah describes the concept of, of rape. The Torah said, he found her in the field and the girl was screaming and nobody could hear her. That's how the Torah describes it. And the Torah compares rape to killing, to murder. That's how the Torah describes it. Kasher ish, kasher yakum ish al reu v'retzachon nefesh. Just as a person will stand up and kill his friend, can a davar azeh, so too is this thing. That's how bad the Torah describes it. Now, the Torah says it's in the field, that the word in the field became like a code word. Mm -hmm. Oh, in the field. <laughs> and every time it's written in the Torah in the field, all the rabbis are making, in the field, what are they doing in the field? Who asked him to go to the field? In the field, there are not good things happening in the field. And I saw it, and there is other a few places and written the word in the field, and the rabbi is making this connection, something connected to this the same topic. Jacob is a, ace of came from the field. What was he doing in the field? Obviously, he was doing something bad. That's how we came, that this was, that was, that's what he was doing. Yeah, but we do see it used in a positive way. For example? Well, is when, yeah, when, when uh, Rebecca comes to him, yeah. um, Isaac was in the field praying. He's going to the field. Yeah, but nothing happens good in the field, I thought. <laughs> you have to look what the matter says on this field. <laughs> he, met, he, met, he met Rebecca, by the way. Yeah, I know, but he hopefully he didn't. Yeah. Abraham buys the field by Mount Machpelah for the doesn't mean, grave. No, but he, doesn't, he didn't went to the field. Somebody mm -hmm. certainly came back from the field or going to the field. That's sure. how the Talmud says it. I remember in other places, too. Number two. Go ahead. We know. We know that he murdered someone, for here it is written that Esau was weary. And elsewhere, in reference to murder, it is written, Woe to me, for my soul is weary of those that murder. Yeah. And we see that the word ayef has a connection to killing. Ayfan afshi laogim. Then the town, it's again, it's a code word. Mm -hmm. And if he was tired, that's why I said before. They knew that he did all these things before they found it in the Bible. Then they're just now making the connections where we can find an hint to it, some type of connection written in the Bible. 
Why is it so important to find a connection that seems to be this tenuous uh, to the Bible? I mean, I can understand if you found a strong connection, but why, why find these connections that they really have to kind of stretch? It's a stretch, yeah, <laughs> yeah. but it's better than, than having just a tradition without any connection. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. What uh, if he was worried because father died? His grandfather died, not his father. Abraham died, not Isaac. Yeah, yeah. And why Jacob was not tired? It was he also was his cooking. grandfather. <laughs> <laughs> he should be more tired. Okay, number three. We know that he denied the fundamental belief, existence of God. For here it is written that Esau said, What is this to me? This, he wanted to use ze. Yeah, go ahead. And elsewhere, for in reference to God, it is written, "This is my God, and I will glorify Him." That the word they use the word Zekeli veanveo. This is my God, and here he says, "Lama zeonoche." The Torah, the Rabbi said, there is some type of a, of, a, of a connection that he denied God. We know that he denied the doctrine of resurrection of the dead, for it is written that Esau said to Jacob, "Look, I am going to die." We know that he belittled the birthright, for it is written in Esau belittled the birthright. That, that one Esau, <laughs> that, that even the one before, Esau said, he, he, Jacob asked him, can you sell me the birthright? Esau said, well, I'm going to die when I need a birthright. If somebody would believe in the resurrection of the dead, so then you will get the birthright and your resurrection of the dead, even if you die. This expression of going to die, what I need it, is a sign of a person who doesn't believe there is after all. There is a life after life, there is a resurrection. Okay. That's we, that's we established that Esau was a bad guy. <laughs> now we'll go back to Ishmael. Go ahead. Where am I? In top Where, of the, page. The, the, the Gemara. Now gives the source for the final opinion recorded in the Brisa that Ishmael repented in Abraham's lifetime. From where do we know that Ishmael repented in Abraham's lifetime? The answer to this is mentioned in the following discussion involving Ravina and Rav Chama Bar Buzi. There is a story about Ravina and Rav Chama were sitting in front of Rabbe, Rove. And Rabbe, Rove was falling asleep. Read, read it, read it, I'm sorry who were sitting before Rava while Rava was dozing. Ravina said to Rav Chama Barazbuzi, are you sure of what you said that any mention of death in scripture where the term Gevia is used describes the death of a righteous person? That's an interesting thought. Usually in the Bible, when it says die, death, it's written via mot, he died. By certain people, it's not written the word dying. It's written vaigva. Vaigva means he expired. He expired. And the time that he said, Rav, uh, Ravine, or yeah, Ravine said it, Rav Chame said it, that any place that's written Gvia means a death of, is, 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 it means it's a death of a tzaddik. It means he didn't die. He expired. So he went to a higher stage. He's, li he's living in a different form, but he didn't die. Death is about somebody, a regular guy. He died. He's over. Okay, did he ask him, is this true? Continue. Rav Hamabar Buzi replied to Ravina, Yes, Ravina asked, but what of the generation of the flood? Although they, they were evil, scripture uses the term Gvia. Gvia in reference to their deaths. He says, you say that every place that's written, he expired, Vaigva. It means it's a death of tzaddikim, of righteous people. <clears throat> We know it's written in the Bible about the about the the, the generation of the flood, the word gvia, the expression that means expired. And they for sure were not tzaddikim. They were not righteous people. That's why they were killed. Okay. Rav Chana replied to Ravina. We refer to the use of the term gvia together with the term asifa. This compound term is used exclusively in reference to the righteous people. Okay, he says, it's written, for example, I think it's written about Jacob. Vaigva vayeosef elamaf. 
Vayikva means and he expired. Vayasef means he was gathered to his people. He went back to his people, to his parents in heaven, so to speak. Oh, to the gravesite of his parents. And there used to be caves, the family cave. Then the, that he says, not, not only when the word gvia alone is written, expiration, expiring. It's when it's written expiring and he was gathering to his people, that's a sign that this person was a tzaddik. Continue. Marina questions even this. But what of Ishmael, concerning whom gvia and asifa was, is written? He says it's written about Ishmael. When Ishmael died, it's written that, he, that, that these two expressions, is Ishmael righteous? Ishmael is righteous, the son of Abraham? That's the question. To gather to his people. That's what I'm saying. Both. Is he, is he, was he Jewish? That's the question. Oh. You say that everywhere it's written the two expressions, it's a sign of a tzaddik. We read the two expressions about Ishmael. What is the why? Go ahead. At this point, Rabbo awoke and said to them, <laughs> Children, <laughs> children, Dadike, this is what Rabbi Yochanan said Ishmael repented in his father's lifetime. As it is said, Abraham's sons, Isaac and Ishmael, buried him. From the order in which they are mentioned, it seems that Ishmael, the older brother, allowed Isaac to go first. This shows that Ishmael had repented. Okay, that first of all, Rove woke up and he told them, guys, yeah, Ishmael died as a righteous man. That's why it's written by him, the two expressions. He was righteous. Say, so how we know that he, that he was righteous? Because when it came to the funeral, it's written that Isaac and Ishmael buried them together. By putting Isaac before Ishmael, it means that Ishmael recognized that Isaac is before him. That's a sign of doing tshuva. Why is it important for Ishmael to repent at this point? He's already gone off the wagon a long time ago. He's you know, got his own 12 tribes. He's got his own story. He's got his own everything. And <laughs> first of all, I don't know if he, at that point he had a story. <laughs> Number two, it was as impo first of all, it's important for Ishmael also to have a relationship with his father. Even today, all the children of Ishmael claim to be the, ch the descendants of Abraham. And it was even more important for Abraham that his son did tshuva. It was important for everybody. Then the point is that this, that he came to the funeral and he led Isaac to lead, meant that he recognized that he's the, he's the right son, so to speak. So this was the ultimate success then of Abraham, that his, his, his wandering son found his way back. So yes, exactly. Yes, 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 yes. And he did it before he died, so to speak. That by the funeral, he was already there. That's the point. He didn't do tshuva the minute of the funeral. You understand what I'm saying? Already recognized that. How we know this, that he did tshuva? Because the text puts Isaac before Ishmael. Go ahead. An objection. An objection is raised uh, to Rabbi Yochanan's interference. Inference. But maybe scripture lists them, Isaac and Ishmael, according to the order of their wisdom, not according to the order of their participation in Abraham's burial. Maybe scripture chose to put Isaac before Ishmael, not because Ishmael was nice and he put Isaac before him, but because the Torah and the list, the two names, Isaac comes first. That makes sense. Isaac was the, what means in the, according to their wisdom, according to their belief in God, according to their who they really are. Not, not, not talking about wisdom, who is smarter, who, who had a better degree in knowledge. You understand what I'm saying? Who is Olia? Yeah, because God blessed Isaac and not Ishmael. He gave more of the blessing. No, more than that, God said that Isaac would be the continuation of Abraham. Right. Yeah. Of the Jewish people. The Gomorrah answers. But if so, that scripture follows the order of wisdom, then in the case of Isaac's burial concerning what is written, Isaac's sons Esau and Jacob buried him. Why does scripture not list them, Esau and Jacob, in the order of their wisdom? If you say that it was because just the scripture on its own decided to put the righteous before the wicked, would have to be also by the funeral of Isaac should be written that I, Jacob and Esau buried them. The reality is actually Ishmael and Isaac, there was 13 years in different, right? 
Esau and, and, and Jacob, it was a minute different. Then if you put Isaac before Ishmael, you should put Jacob before Esau. And the Torah did not do it. The Torah wrote, and uh, uh, Esau and Jacob buried them. Obviously, it's not because of your wisdom. Go ahead. Evidently, scripture does not follow the order of wisdom in such a context. Therefore, since in connection with Abraham's burial, scripture mentions Isaac first, it is evident that Ishmael persuaded Isaac to go first. Go ahead. And from that fact that Ishmael persuaded Isaac to go first, one can infer that Ishmael repented in Abraham's lifetime. Basically, the town would establish that Ishmael came back home. Persuaded. What, what's the Hebrew word? Could it say it? Allowed? He allowed him to go? Uh, no, encouraged them. With Persu- Adbari. Yeah. Adbari is a word in Aramaic. Then, but what did this mean? It means to me that Talmud says that Ishmael came back home. Finished. No matter how you twist it. And he, was, and he told Isaac, he came to the funeral, he told Isaac, you go first. All the family came together. By the funeral, everybody comes together. Everybody's loving. They come together there. It was here the speaker, you know. It's Friday night, he said, only when, you, only when you're dead, you realize how many people, how many people remember you when, they, when they're sure that you're dead. <laughs> 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 okay, that's, that's about Ishmael and Esau. That we, 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 are, we remember the old discussion is what we learn with the word bakol. God blessed Abraham with all things that we said one of the things that God blessed him that he didn't see Esau becoming a bad boy and he saw Ishmael becoming a good boy that he died in peace. He died, he saw how everything is in place. He's the only one who dies in peace in the entire Bible, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Jacob? No, Jacob said at the end of his life he says how tough his life is, right? Well, he complained a, a little bit. It's a, <laughs> yeah, it's little a bit. Jewish thing. <laughs> <laughs> He complained 17 years before he died. Yeah. And then those, and this last he had, 17 he years He has the best tov. 17 years of his life. Tov. Yeah, tov. tov. He had the best 17 years of his life. Actually, if anybody, Jacob, it's interesting that for 15 years, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were alive together. Can you see what's going on? The 12 years, that was, therefore there is 15 Shira Malos in, in the book of Psalms. Because for 15 years, the three forefathers were together in the world. It's a very interesting, it's a interesting observation that the Talmud makes. But Jacob, if talking about anybody who died in peace, it's Jacob. Because Jacob had all his children around his bed, all of them believing in the same God. And actually, Jacob asked him the famous question, Shema Israel. He says, are you all believing, are you all on the same page with me? And they all said yes. Then, uh, then Jacob is the ultimate. Abraham, yeah, but God, God promised Abraham, and you will die in 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 good in good uh, old in good old. I mean, good age it means to say you'll die in peace. God promised that to Abraham to begin. God told him, your your children will suffer later, but you will not see it. That's how the rabbis are coming to all these conclusions because God promised them in the famous covenant of the power. God told them. God predicted them that his children are going to suffer for 400 years, but you will not see the suffering. Now we learn another meaning to the word bakol. Who is next? Go for it. Another Baraisa that discusses the blessing of bakol with everything bestowed upon Abraham. The rabbi taught in a Baraisa, there were three people whom the Holy One, blessed be he, gave a taste in this world. Turn the page. Of a semblance of the world to come. They are Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Okay, here comes an interesting thing. God gave them a taste of the world to come while they are alive. The truth is, everyone has a little bit of it. Every one of us. But you shouldn't be stupid and know when we feel it. Everyone has, 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 of us has spiritual moments that you feel uplifted. And these moments are, if you're connecting to them, this is your Olam Abba. This is your world to come while you are alive. There is a verse that says, Olam Chati Rebbe You'll see the world to come while you are alive. 
Don't have to wait to be dead, then to see, then to enjoy life, the, the world to come. While you are alive, there is a, there is a verse in the, in the book of Psalms, Becho Hashem Chosisi, God, I have trusted in you, and therefore I will never be embarrassed forever. I'll never be shamed forever. Then the Medrash is asking, did the Jews are never shame forever? They always have a shame in Tertzores. Medrash is answering, in the world to come. The Rebbe once spoke about that. What kind of an answer is that in the world to come? The Rebbe said, in the world to come while you are alive. If you elevate yourself a little higher, you can experience the world to come while you are alive. Mm-hmm. Means to say, you're living on a different level. For example, and this is an example that we brought a few times. It's an example about converts. It's written when a convert comes to the Jewish people, what do you tell them? No. Don't do it. Don't do it. What do you need to do? It? We are all suffering. They stab us on Jerusalem streets. They eat us everywhere. They're doing BDS. You name it. You're crazy. Don't do it. If you insist, insist and insist and insist, then we convert them. What do you tell them after you convert? Congratulations. You are so lucky you joined the Jewish people. <laughs> And the Talmud says, the Rebbe once spoke about it. What? It's like two paragraphs in my mind at this, one after the other. Like, are you okay or what? Oh, are, you, are you normal? A minute ago you said that joining the Jewish people is the terrible thing. A minute later you say, oh, you're so lucky you joined the people of God. Yeah. What is this? The Rebbe said something very interesting. Depends how you look of it. A person lays in bed and there is a fly that bothers him in his ear. He tries to fall asleep and something zooms on his head and drives him nuts. He's miserable. Then somebody walks into the room and tells him, you know, we have have a bag of money that we got a present we found somewhere. We need to count the money now. He jumps out of bed. He starts to count the money quick, 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 quick. The same Nujirai, the same fly continues to bother him. What he cares now, or he doesn't care? Okay. He forget, suddenly he forgot about the fly. He doesn't hear it. He doesn't even hear it. What changed? The perspective. Mm-hmm. The same thing is, what happens here? A guy comes to convert. As an outsider, and you look as an outsider on the Jewish people, you have to be crazy to join the Jewish people. The moment you become an insider, and you have a different perspective, you appreciate the connection with God, then you realize how lucky you are. That's what Olama buys. Olama buys the world to come means it's changing your perspective. Oh, Abada by Israel calls and writes me, oh, the life is... I told them, I, I just changed his perspective in a minute and, and he looked on life a little different. I told him, you know where you are, you know what you're representing, you know? What are you complaining? He was complaining about competition. I told him, you have 1,400 young families with Jewish children and and you have a message that nobody can, 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 can compete with you. What, what are you afraid about? Some phrase or some rabbi you will, eh, it's nothing. You elevate them and suddenly the whole world, the rest of the world is like a piece of, piece of cake. Then what do you think Abraham did when people were cured? He elevated them. When you see how lucky you are, people complain. Complain, oh, life is better. You stop him and you tell him, your life is so bad, let's see how good your life is. And in five minutes, he can, can, can start smiling, he can dance, because he start to realize how bad that is. The Tolama buys, and that's what God gave Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He gave them a taste of the world to come. They were so connected, they were living in a different level than the mundane things didn't bother them. My father told me what he did in Chastora when he was in Russia in jail because he tried to escape to Israel. What he used to say, he used to close his eyes and start to dance. And in his own mind, he was in, 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 in shul. And then he can be happy. You understand what I'm saying? And he says, we, how we know that Abraham had Olam Abba? Okay, the scriptural source. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, right there. We know. Source. Okay, I was just so caught up. I'm sorry. <laughs> we know that Abraham merited this blessing, for it, it is written of him, Hashem blessed Abraham with everything. Bakol. Bakol. Everything means everything, literally everything. 
It's about Isaac. Isaac, for it is everything. Okay. No, for for because uh, uh, it's written. Oh, Isaac, for it is written of him. I ate from everything. It's written about Isaac. You know, there is three expressions the world call we find by the three forefathers, by Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Abraham, as we just said, God blessed Abraham, Bakol, in everything. Isaac, when he tells Esau about the blessing, that he told him, your brother Jacob came in and gave me food, and I blessed him. That's what he said, he gave me food. Vo'ochal mikol, and I ate everything. Then we see the expression mikol, not bakol, but mikol, the word kol, everything. And by Jacob, there is again, when Jacob met Esau, and he wanted to give him a present, and Jacob didn't, and Esau didn't want to take, then Jacob told him, God bless me with everything. Kol, yes, I have everything. That's why, you know where we say it? Look in the bottom, number four, the knot. This is the source for the sentence in Birkat Amazon and Grace After Meal. We say, Rachman, Yvor, Hatan, Kola, Shakimo, Shibachu, Tavotenu. As you blessed our fathers, Avraham, Mitzvah, Yaakov, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Bakol, Mikol, Kol, Ken Yvor, Hatan, right? If you remember the song from the benching, Bakol, Mikol, Kol, Ken Yvor. What is Bakol, Mikol? It's a chord. Let's talk about Bakol, Mikol, Kol, the three verses that one is by Abraham, one is by Isaac, one is by Jacob. That we tell God, just as you blessed Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Bakol, Mikol, Kol, everything, everything, with everything, so too give us the blessing too. Then this is, when you say Bakol, Mikol, Kol, today in, in the language of people who know this, it's almost like a code. It's, they know the Berkat Amazon. It's based on three different verses in the Bible. Well, of this Talmudic. That's why it's coming. We say it because of this Talmudic story. And now go to the third one, Jacob. Jacob, for it is written of him, I have everything, all. The, these expressions of coal, everything, indicate that the patriarchs enjoyed every possible blessing even a taste of the world to come. They got everything. Ah, oh, lucky they are. Okay, you want to continue? Here comes another explanation what the call means. The Baraisa continues. There were three people over whom the evil inclination had no power. There were Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The scriptural sources were written of them respectively, with everything from everything, everything. This expressions, everything signify not only physical benefits, but spiritual achievement as well. Okay, this Talmud says that the Yetzer Ore did not control Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They did not have an evil inclination. They were tzaddikim. You know what a tzaddik is? A tzaddik is that does not, not only he doesn't do bad things, he doesn't have desires to do bad things. doesn't even have something that pulls him in this direction. Does he have an evil inclination or he conquers his evil inclination? Oh. That's a different uh, discussion. That depends if he was a tzaddik from the beginning or not. But if he's born a tzaddik, to begin with, he's on a different level. He's on a whole different... It's written about Isaac, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They were on Merkove, Lelokos. Merkove, Lelokos means a chariot to God. Your car has his own will? No. It's a will, but not a will. doesn't have his own desire, right? The same thing Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That my car does not have his own desire, it's not an accomplishment, because he doesn't have brains, he's not a human being. But when a human being does not have his own desires, only the desires of God, that's a huge accomplishment. That Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are on a whole different level. There is a reason why they're considered the forefathers of the Jewish people. Not because they were just that nice white beard. <laughs> they, were, they were on a whole different level. That it means to say that even, you know, sometimes you read the Bible, Abraham did this, I think. Whatever they did, it was the will of God. It was not because they had an evil inclination in them. It's a whole different attitude, how we learn the Bible, that how modern commentators, or uh, what do they call them, modern? Yeah, try to learn the Bible. They look at the Bible, like Abraham was the friend in a classmate. and said, oh, if I would do this, I would be because of the this. But didn't they have a choice sometimes, but it was a choice between good and and good, good, and good. You already yeah. said that? Yeah. <laughs> and good is even more good. 
Yeah, but Nachmanides is a classic commentator, and he kind of takes that position too. Did what? Uh, he's fairly critical of Abraham, certainly. Critical of Abraham. That's why he didn't make it big in, in a lot of Judaism, because he, even liberal Jews like Abraham. And you know, it says there that he did not, he did not have a Yitzhara. <laughs> and I'll tell you, since Kabbalah came, Hasidus came, the way we look at Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, it's on a whole different level. And I think after anybody who learns Kabbalah and Hasidus understand, they're talking about, if you're talking about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, when we say it's a chariot to God, it means to say, that even things that look bad, it was because, because God wanted them to do it. You understand what I'm saying? They didn't do it because they wanted. They, it happened because God wanted it to go this direction. Even when it looks bad. That's how connected they were. They were not able to do something wrong. There's a story about the fifth Chabad Rebbe. He was sitting on a big meeting of great rabbis in Russia. The government wanted to change Jewish law to make it to reform Jewish laws. The Russian government, the Tsar. And it was a big guy, it was, it was the modern, the enlightened rabbis who were on the side of the government, and they were the traditional rabbis. And there was a whole group of traditional <coughs> rabbis, and in the head was sitting the fifth Chabad, Lubavitch Rebbe. And came one issue, and he said no. That Chaim Priske, a famous rabbi, asked him, Rebbe, why not? Like, he says, you know what he said? He says, I train my body that whatever God doesn't want, I don't want. Not bad, huh? <laughs> it means he didn't really have a good logical explanation why it's not good. He says, I just, I, whatever it's not good, I re my, my, my mind rejects automatically. It's like your body, when you eat something not healthy, it rejects. A tzaddik automatically rejects what it's not against God. That if Abraham did something, it's because God wanted him to do it. If not, it wouldn't happen. He would reject automatically what, what, what that's not right. That's what, a, that's what a chariot to God means. Somebody that worked on his body and his soul so much that he's completely devoted to God, that if God doesn't want to, somehow he will not go, not go well with him. If he ate something not kosher, by mistake he will throw up. He will, his body will just not be able to digest it. If they don't have a yetzer heart, does that mean they don't sin? Hey, you bet. <laughs> And much more than not just sin. Mm -hmm. Even people who have Yitzhorahs don't sin. People who don't have Yitzhorahs. Here is about David, what they said about King David. The Barisa continues with a dissenting view. Some scholars say that King David as well was immune from the wiles of the evil incarnation. Mm -hmm. The scriptural source, for it is written that David said, my heart, i.e. the evil inclination, has died within me. King David says, my, my heart has died for me. That means to say, according to Talmud, that he, he killed his Yetzirah. No more, he had, and he killed him. Okay, the Gemara asked. The Gemara asks, and the other Tana, the first opinion recorded in the Barisa, why does he not include David? Yeah, why he doesn't consider David to be a part of it? The Gemara an answers that according to the first Tana, David's verse, my heart has died within me, does not refer to the evil inclination. Mm -hmm. In this verse, David recalls his suffering as a result of many troubles. His heart was bereft of feeling. Basically, one time he says that it's just, he says, I'm suffering so much physically. It's nothing to do with the Yetzirah. The other time he says, he killed his Yetzirah. And, the time, and it's written in Tanya, the book of the classical book of Chabad, then that he, he killed them. How he, David killed his Yetzirah? By fasting. He was fasting so much until his, he killed his desire to physical thing. It doesn't mean that he had an anorexia, but he just killed his end. Although, I was just reading last night, the what? Hadron, yeah. 106B or 107A. <laughs> okay, I'm not going to check. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> and King David, the whole thing with King David with the, with the bird, and, uh, and then he said, and basically, it's, it, the conclusion was that David says, and it's not actually in the text, but apparently that, um, that he could have, conquered his evil inclination, uh, but it would have been to uh, upright Hashem and prove him wrong or something. So basically he doesn't get help when, when it's, uh, but, but he doesn't, he's not, he has not destroyed his evil inclination because they actually see in the Gemara that, that it Depends on which part of life his life. Could be later in his life he destroyed his evil inclination. Okay, that's true. 
Well, what about Moses? You would think he'd be right up. Moses, 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 <laughs> Moses. We are coming to Moses right now. Oh, no. Not about <laughs> David. Yes. We are making it to Moses. What, 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 back to King David. He needed his Yitzhara at, at the beginning of his life. I mean, I mean, slowing blood. I mean, doing things that... That's what, that's what I said. That's what was in the middle of his life. Right, right. That, and it wasn't he was born like by my sick Jacob without a Yitzhara. He ate a right, right, right. And later in his life... Because yeah, that, that was his job. So he, You're right. He needed this force. I mean, uh, no? It's complicated. So explain it's very complicated. complicated. So, I don't know. Does the Yitzhara like, add to, to mm. his ability to... Yeah. Without a Yitzhara, we wouldn't need anything. You know, people who have only a, a godly inclination, they look like... No, they look like they look like the people are vegans. Well, well only <laughs> <laughs> they look like this. <laughs> you need a yitzhara to want to accomplish something. You need to have an ego. If you don't have an ego, you got nowhere. <laughs> only Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob can accomplish everything without a yitzhara. Regular people can get nowhere. So what's the last? The goal, the goal is to take a yitzhara and to redirect them. Taking your horse and to redirect them to the right place. But if you don't have horse power, you are nowhere. You know, you know when, when, uh, when in the beginning, when the rabbi started outreach, it was a mitzvah. You know what a mitzvah looks like? A mitzvah you do five minutes when you have nothing else to do. It's, oh, three o'clock, no, no, I'll go. It's a, it, people looked at it as a volunteer thing. That's the way it looked like. Over the years, the, the achievement of the rabbi is that he made being a Chabad rabbi a job, a life, a, a career. That you don't have to be holy to do it, you understand? Mm. That he turned the holy job into something that is good for you, for your ego, for your own. Just like being a lawyer and a doctor, it's a career for life. Now, many, many people want to be Chabad rabbis. It's not anymore a holy thing for people who are suffering. It's the most exciting thing. The, the job is to, Judaism should not be something, you know. You know, once somebody called my brother in China, I told him, I'm coming to China, do you need something? My brother tells him, yeah, I need a, a case of uh, milk, like a false milk or whatever it is. Then, uh, I meant maybe you need a mezuzah. Uh, he's ready to bring a mezuzah, you understand? He was ready to do a mitzvah. <laughs> That's what it looks like. We need people with evil inclinations to accomplish the world. People with good inclinations get nowhere. That's a sad, a sad part. Then let's see what the Gemara says about next. About a... Um, the Gemara quotes another Beresa, which deals with a similar theme. The rabbis taught in a Beresa there were six people over whom the angel of death did not have dominion. Their souls were taken by God himself. They are Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. Moses is there. He made it. <laughs> okay. The scriptural source. Continue. The scriptural sources. We know that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were accorded this honor, for it is written of them, respectively, with everything, from everything, everything. And we know, thing, Go ahead. And we know that Moses, Aaron, and Miriam were accorded this honor, for it is written of them by the mouth of Hashem, i.e. they died through a kiss from God, not at the hands of the angel of death. That God himself took them. He didn't send the angel of death. Mm -hmm. By kiss of God. It's called Mises Neshike. God kissed them and they died. There was no suffering, there was nothing. They laid down and they, they expired. The Gemara asks, go ahead, Mr. Holgen. But the verse, by the mouth of God, is not written in connection with Miriam. So how do we know that Miriam's soul was taken by God himself? Yeah. The Gemara answers, Rabbi Eliezer said, Miriam also died through a kiss from God. This emerges from analogy between the word there that is written in connection with the death of Miriam and the same word there that is written in reference to the death of Moses. Mm -hmm. And why is the phrase by the mouth of Hashem not stated explicitly in connection with Miriam? Because it would be indelicate to say such a thing. Thank God, kiss Miriam. It doesn't look good. It's not so sneers, Dick, you know. <laughs> kiss women. Yeah. 
But he really, she died the same way that Moses, that Moses and Aaron died. That's what the Talmud says. Then these six already, we expanded the club, six people, God himself took them. Now a third b'raise and a similar team. The rabbis taught in the b'raise that there were seven people whose corpses were not affected with worms or maggots. They are you hear, there is a whole thing in Judaism that a person is buried, his body should be intact. For good. Tzadikim, a true tzadik, he, he works on his body so much, his body becomes a chariot for God, that anything, why the soul is forever? Because the soul is a part of God. A tzadik, he accomplished that his body becomes a part of God. That if the body becomes a part of God, it stays intact. And I mentioned a few times the story, the same fifth Chabad Rebbe who said that he trained his body to do only do with a, he was buried in a city, it's called Rostov, Sisti exists in, in Russia. Ten years later, the government, the Russian government decided, the communist government decided to take the Jewish field, uh, cemetery and pull to an highway. That was a part of the highway. Then uh, the Hasid, ten Hasid went and they pulled and they moved the, the coffin, the gravesite of the Rebbe from one place from the old from the cemetery to another cemetery. It was a dawn at night, in secrecy, and so on. Later, one of the ten wrote a letter to his son, the previous Lubavitch Rebbe, was already outside of Russia. Told him exactly, detailing who was participating in what happened and what time at night they came and how they did it. They opened the bar, they opened the grave, and ten years later, the Rebbe was laying there like the minute he was just buried. Okay. Nothing was touched. He says, one foot was not straight, we stayed to straight the foot a little bit down. Ten years later, it's a clear, the copy of the letter is published, everybody can see it. And it, I mean, it's ten people were there, not one. Not somebody made up a story. What they took a minion of Hasidim, and, and there is stories like this, quite a few stories about, there is a story about the Zushi of Anipoli, when the Nazis came to Anipoli, the Goim told them, go to the cemetery, it must be there a lot of money there, why? Because all the Jews are going there constantly. Obviously, they're protecting the treasure. It was the grave site of a tzaddik, of Rabzu Shavanipoli. That the Nazis forced the Jews to dig up the grave. They dig up the, they dig up the grave, and they found an intact body. Mm -hmm. Many years later, talk about 100 years later, probably. Mm -hmm. And there is stories in the Talmud. Here the Talmud says, these people, they, 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 they didn't control them. The maggots didn't need them. How is this whole line of thought consistent with uh, the several verses in the Bible that say that everybody sins? Ecclesiastes, mm -hmm. King, First Kings, and whatever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you. In one world. And Sadiq Barat, you know the question I was asked when I was 11 years old? I remember I once was coming to my grandfather's house and was an uncle, like a cousin or something, and we spoke about the Rebbe, and I said, the Rebbe is a tzaddik, he cannot sin, and this. And he told me, it's written in the Bible. There's no tzaddik who can, uh, and tzaddik ba'at, as she has said, tov elo echtad. There's not, no righteous man, how you said that? You quoted it very nicely in English. Yeah, there's no righteous person does not sin. No. Yeah. Who yeah, never yeah, sin. yeah, 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 yeah. Or never cannot be a righteous person, never sin. What is the word sin means? That's a question. Chet. It's written on Rosh Chodesh that God, you know, on Rosh Chodesh you bring a sin offering, right? In the time of the temple. Why you bring a sin offering? For whom? Who are we sinning? Who are we atoning for? We're always doing something wrong. <laughs> we are atoning, the Talmud puts it, we are atoning for God that he made the moon smaller. You know, when God created the world, mm -hmm. the sun and the moon were two big illuminaries, and then the moon became smaller. That God is asking from the Jewish people to bring a sin offering to atone for his sin that he made the moon smaller. Then the question is, is God sinning? God is sins? Obviously the word sin means, it comes from the word chisaron. Chisaron means not done completely. It means to say, it's not that the tzaddik sins, but he always could do more. You understand? That's what the word chet means. No matter who you are, no matter how much you do, every tzaddik, every night he beats himself up. Why he didn't do it this way? 
That's what the word chet. Cannot be a tzaddik and not who, uh, in the world who did not miss something. But that doesn't mean the literal meaning of sinning. Shukrah.